This video is about the concept of electronegativity. So when we're thinking about covalently bonded molecules, what we know is that a covalent bond involves sharing of pairs of electrons between two atoms. Like in this Lewis dot structure for O2 here, we see that there's a double bond sharing of two pairs of electrons between these two oxygen atoms. Now when we have identically bonded atoms like we do here in O2, what we can say is that these electrons are shared equally. Equal sharing of the electrons between the two oxygens. So like good kindergartners, they're going to agree to share their electrons absolutely equally. So that means that there's no change in electron density on one oxygen atom or the other. They both have the same electron density. But for bonds between different atoms, the electrons may not be shared equally. So for example, in HCl, which has this Lewis dot structure, what we discover is that the electrons that are shared between these two atoms get pulled towards the chlorine. So the electron density shifts in this molecule towards the chlorine. So this is going to be unequal sharing of electrons. Another way of saying this is that the electron density has shifted towards the chlorine. In a quantum theory way, we might say that the probability of finding the electron is higher near the chlorine atom than it is near the hydrogen atom. So these electrons that are being shared are being pulled in this direction. An analogy here might be like a tug of war for these shared electrons. So this little cartoon that I've drawn, rather poorly I guess, um, we show here a tug of war for these shared pair of electrons between the hydrogen and the chlorine. And what we might imagine is that the chlorine atom has a stronger pull and hydrogen has a weaker pull. And so this results in electron density being shifted away from the hydrogen and towards the chlorine atom. So if there really is pulling going on between atoms, uh, pulling of electrons between atoms that are being shared, we need a way of measuring how strong that pull is. And that's what electronegativity is all about. By way of definition then, we could say that electronegativity is the relative ability or relative strength of an atom to draw a bonding electron density towards itself. So we want to compare how much stronger is chlorine than hydrogen, and we want to associate a number with that. So it turns out there's no way to directly measure electronegativity on an absolute scale. So what you have to do is establish a relative scale using other kinds of experimental data and we're going to base it on a set of rules and assumptions. And because there are rules and assumptions involved, and people might use different kinds of experimental data, there are a lot of different electronegativity scales out there. So currently, there are probably more than 15 or so different electronegativity scales that are in use. What's good, though, is that there's relatively close agreement of an electronegativity value, of a relative electronegativity value, for any given atom. And so that gives us confidence that even though we're using different assumptions and different sets of data, that we're getting similar kinds of electronegativities. The first scale, the first electronegativity scale, was invented by uh, Linus Pauling. And so these are sometimes called the Pauling electronegativities. I'm going to abbreviate electronegativity as EN, so whenever you see me write EN, that means electronegativity. So Linus Pauling assigned fluorine the value of 4.0, rather arbitrarily, as sort of the strongest, most electronegative atom. So fluorine, based on the data that he had, and he was looking primarily at bond energies, seemed to have the highest ability to pull electrons towards itself. So he assigned that a value of four, and then based on experimental data, came up with relative numbers for all of the other elements. And here is the Pauling electronegativity scale. You can see that on the Pauling scale, as I told you, fluorine has an electronegativity value of 4.0. And here are the electronegativity values of the other atoms. And generally, we can see that as we go across a row of the periodic table, electronegativity values appear to go up. And as we go down a column, electronegativity values generally go down. So the uh, non-metals that are up here tend to have the highest electronegativities, and the metals that are down here tend to have the lowest electronegativities. So there are other scales, and the scale that we are going to use most often is a new scale that was developed in 1989, and it links electronegativity values to average valence electron energies. And those are based on photoelectron spectroscopy data. So the key assumption of that model is that atoms that best resist the loss of valence electrons are more likely to draw electron density from a bond towards itself. So if it's hard to pull the electrons 
away from the valence shell, we're going to imagine that those any atom that happens to be in the valence shell that's being shared, any electron that happens to be in the valence shell that's being shared, is going to be pulled close to that atom. And so this is the scale that we are going to use most often in this class. And it's the scale by Allen. So sometimes these are called Allen electronegativities. And so this scale is taking the AVE e values that we've already seen and adjusting them so that fluorine has a value that's kind of around four. And um, so we're going to get a scale that looks kind of similar to the Powling scale, but has some different numbers in a few places. And in particular, it's going to give us some data for uh, these noble gases up here, helium, neon, and argon. So here's the Allen scale. Um, neon has the highest electronegativity here, shown in red. Cesium has the lowest here, shown in uh, yellow. So the general trend is that as we move from left to right across a row of the periodic table, electronegativity values go up. As we go down top to bottom, electronegativity values go down. So that's the same pattern that we saw with average valence electron energies. So one thing that we have to note is the placement of hydrogen. So hydrogen is here. In terms of electronegativity values, it kind of occurs right here between boron and carbon. So that's an important one to remember. Also notice that helium has a lower electronegativity value than neon. And fluorine actually has a higher electronegativity value than helium as well. So this is the electronegativity scale that we are going to use. So how do we use that scale? One way that you use that scale is to talk about different types of bonds. OK, so in one case, we want to consider if the difference in electronegativities is very large. So my little symbol here, this is the capital Greek letter delta. Looks like a little triangle. Delta means difference. So delta En means the difference in electronegativities between two atoms. And we're always going to take this difference to be the larger electronegativity minus the smaller electronegativity. So if that difference is very large, then we're going to get a particular kind of bond. Let's look, for example, at sodium chloride, NaCl. So if we look back on our uh, table of Allen electronegativities, the difference in electronegativity, chlorine has a higher electronegativity than sodium. Chlorine's electronegativity is 2.87. We're going to subtract from that the electronegativity of sodium, which is 0.87. And so that gives us an electronegativity difference 2.0, which is a very large electronegativity difference. So in that case, we imagine what's happening in this tug of war for a shared electrons, that the electron density gets shifted completely to the chlorine. So I'm going to draw little sketches of what might look like the electron clouds. And so that electron density has been shifted from the sodium to the chlorine, so that this chlorine atom has sort of an excess negative charge on it. And since the sodium has been stripped of some of its valence electrons, it ends up with sort of a positive charge on it. And this really looks mostly like this kind of picture. We've got a sodium cation attracted through some sort of electrostatic force to the chloride ion. And that's what we call an ionic bond. So when the electronegativity differences are really great between two bonded atoms, that's going to form an ionic bond. And we're actually going to almost essentially completely transfer an electron over. So if the difference in electronegativity is 0 between two bonded atoms, we say that that is a pure covalent bond or a nonpolar covalent bond. So you'll see why we call it a nonpolar covalent bond when we talk a little bit about what a uh, polar covalent bond is. So an example of this kind of molecule might be O2. So because the two bonded atoms are exactly the same, the difference in electronegativity will be exactly 0. We also will sometimes call nonpolar covalent bonds uh, bonds that have really small differences in electronegativity. So we might, for example, consider this bond between a carbon atom and a hydrogen atom to have a small difference in electronegativity. So the difference in electronegativity, delta En. So the electronegativity value of carbon is 2.54, which is a little bit higher than the electronegativity value of hydrogen at 2.30. And that gives us an electronegativity difference of 0.24. And so that's pretty small. And so in this case, we're going to say that we have an essentially pure covalent or nonpolar covalent bond. And this bond, the carbon-hydrogen bond, actually has a small amount of polar covalent character. So if difference in electronegativity is sort of moderate to large, but not very large, then we have what's called a polar covalent bond. And an example might be HF. 
Fluorine has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So the difference in electronegativity is going to be the electronegativity of fluorine, which is 4.19 on the Allen scale, minus the electronegativity of hydrogen, which again is 2.30. And we get a difference of 1.89. And so that's getting big enough that it almost that it's almost an ionic bond, but, but not quite. And so we imagine what's going on here is that there's a big shift in electron density away from the hydrogen and towards the fluorine. So if we were to draw little clouds here representing the electron clouds, then it's kind of big and fluffy here around the fluorine. And what we say is this the fluorine, since it has a higher probability of having electron density around it, picks up a partial negative charge. And so we're going to represent partial charges this way. So this would be a partial negative charge. So this little symbol that I drew that looks like this is the lowercase Greek letter delta. So we've seen the uppercase Greek letter delta is this triangle right here. And so the triangle means sort of a big difference. The little lowercase delta then is kind of a symbol for a little difference. So we've got a little bit more negative charge here on the fluorine than we should. And since we pulled that electron density away from the hydrogen, we sort of exposed its nuclear core, the proton that's there. And so what's left behind then is the posit residual positive charge from that nuclear core once we strip some of the electron density away. So this becomes partially positive. And so this is now a molecule that has two ends. I might kind of represent it this way. So here's a little ball. Here's a little stick. There's another ball right there. This one over here has a little bit of a positive charge. And this one right here is a little bit of a negative charge. So we have a molecule with two ends. So we say that this is a dipole, an electric dipole. Electric because it's based on electric charges, positive and negative electric charges. And dipole just means something with two ends. So this word polar that I've used already means something that has two ends. You've seen that before like magnets. Magnets have two ends two ends, a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole. Our Earth is like a big bar, bar magnet. It has a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole. So we call the ends of our planets the polar regions because of the magnetic poles. So polar refers to anything that has sort of two ends like this. And so an HF molecule is like that. It has a positive end and a negative end because of this unequal sharing of electrons. So electronegativity then helps us determine bond types and it also helps us think about the distribution of charge in our molecule and where um, there's going to be a buildup in electron density. We can visualize that electron density even better by looking at something called an electrostatic potential map. So here's an electrostatic potential map so showing three different diatomic substances. So first we've got lithium hydride here, which is made up of a lithium atom and a hydrogen atom. So in this case, the hydrogen is more electronegative than the lithium, and so it's pulling the electron density towards itself. So what this picture shows, it's a surface drawn around the electron cloud of this molecule so as to um, encircle a, a large percentage of the electron density, like 99%. And so this kind of gives you the shape of the molecule. And then on this surface, we've painted colors that represent the force that a charged particle would experience if we put it on that surface. So if the color is redder, it means that that surface has a much higher negative charge. If the surface is towards the blue or purple end of the rainbow, then it means that it has a much higher positive charge. And so these two, three diatomic molecules, LiH, H2, the molecule hydrogen, and HF, all show you how the electron clouds have changed shape. So here with hydrogen, the color is all the same all the way around this sort of um, ellipsoid shaped molecule. Whereas in lithium hydride, you see that we have a lot of electron density transferred to the hydride and that it's very negative in character. Whereas the lithium has been stripped of electron density, so this side of the molecule is kind of looks like a little nose poking out here. It's much smaller, and this is much po more positive in charge. Whereas the hydrogen H2 is a pure covalent bond, the difference in electronegativity is zero, so charge is spread out evenly. 
Here HF, we've already looked at this. This is a very, a very polar molecule. And you can see that by looking at the surface. We begin to strip electron density away from the hydrogen and build it up around the fluorine. And this end of the molecule has a lot of excess negative charge on it. So it has a higher partial negative charge. And this end of the molecule has been stripped of electron density. And so it's where we have the partial positive charge. And so the electro, electrostatic potential map shows you that sort of graphically with numbers. And these come from uh, quantum theory calculations.